This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. Um, seeing a presence of a quorum of the regional school, Amherst Pelham Regional School Committee, I'm calling to order this meeting at 6.35 p.m. I will um, call out your name. Please stay present when, um, when I call your name. Mr. Demling? Demling present. Uh, Ms. Kenny? Kenny present. Ms. Seeger? Seeger present. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer present. Ms. Dancer? Answer present. Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan present. And McDonald present. Um, uh, at least one of our other uh, members that are not here will be joining us later. Um, also, uh, as um, mentioned um, earlier, I would um, propose that we switch the order of the published agenda um, and switch to items and begin first, actually um, just move item number one to later in the agenda so that we begin with item number two, the public comment RSC topics only, continue with athletics, item number three, um, and then move to um, item number one, which would be our executive session. So um, is the committee amenable to that um, agenda change? Wonderful, okay. Um, so we will begin with public comment. Um, for folks that are watching from home, um, I apologize, I was late in getting the document ready. So it is, um, I don't believe that it's on our website yet, but I did post it on my school committee Facebook page. Um, so if for some reason you're not able to read along as, we, um, as I uh, project this on screen, um, please feel free to wander over to my Facebook page and grab it from there. Um, we have some public comment, right? Uh, no, the, the, sorry, the voice comment is for the joint meeting. So, are folks able to see that uh, the public comment document? Um, and just a note, uh, just as a reminder for folks, again, at home, um, this includes comments that came into our email address with the subject line public comment. We do receive a lot of email, and um, a, uh, there were some emails that came in without the subject line public comment. I apologize if you had intended it for public comment, um, and if so, please resend it in with that subject line.
so that is the uh, conclusion of the public comment. Uh, so now we move on to what was item number three on our agenda, which is um, discussion of the athletics for fall 2020. Yeah, and if I could queue it up and then turn it over to Ms. Stewart. So um, what we'd like to do, and Ms. Stewart's done a really nice job um, presenting a summary of the information about what the changes to the sports seasons, um, the modifications to fall sports, because that's what we're kind of primarily talking about today and really um, sport by sport going through that with some pros and cons towards the end and open up for dialogue. I think it's likely the case, although the agenda said, you know, possible vote or um, that, you know, we're happy to come back next week um, because we'd like to present this. I know you have some public comment, but there may be some questions that you have that Ms. Stewart or I are able to get more information about. And we try as best we can on a decision this big to have you all be able to deliberate, uh, ask questions and consider it before coming back to next week for a vote. So, uh, you know, I think we're comfortable with that timeline. Most schools, districts in our area are, are planning on voting. Some have voted already, but many are voting next week. And to clarify why you're voting, um, we are now um, going to be starting the year remotely. And according to the state rules, any district starting the year remotely needs a school committee vote on whether to have athletics or not. If we weren't starting the year remotely, it would be a different topic. Uh, we still want to fill you in, but on this one, it actually does require a vote of the regional school committee up or down uh, on athletics. So um, now that I get all that kind of non-fun stuff out of the way, I'll turn it over to Ms. Stewart, um, who has some slides to present that were also in the packet that was is on our website right now. But thank you for being here, Victoria. Thank you guys all for having me. You guys can all hear me okay? Yep. Yep. Great. So um, as Dr. Morris said, I'm going to speak to you guys about the reintegration of athletics in our schools. Um, the MIA did come out with a press release on August 19th in regards to the MIA COVID task force that they put together in the summer on fall sports. And in this document, it states that individual school committee meetings must approve of athletics because we are starting remotely. The attached document also um, has uh, presents each sports and seasons which um, we are allowed to have. And additionally, the MIA is referred to the EEA guidelines to determine the risk levels and activities of each sport. So these are the levels um, of activity that we can have, level one being the least amount of activity for a sport to hold. That includes any individual or socially distant group activity. And then level four being the most activity that we're allowed to have. Um, that includes tournaments. And if you can't see it on your screen, in parentheses, it says outdoors only. Each sport is categorized as either lower risk, moderate risk, or high risk. The low risk sports can participate in all one, two, three, four levels that were seen on the previous slide. And as far as moderate and high risk, they have the same rules. Um, they can participate in level one activities, um, but they can also participate in two and three if modifications are met. And the MIA did come up with modifications last week for each sport. So you can see here, I know you guys received the um, slides beforehand, but the hyperlinks to each modifications for the uh, sports are attached to each sport. Uh, as you can see, the green cross country and golf are low risk sports. Moderate risk sports are field hockey, volleyball, and soccer. These are the sports that we are allowed to have in the fall. The only sport you see missing here is football. Football has been moved to the floating season because it is seen as a high risk sport. And I'll get into what a floating season is a little bit later. As far as the winter season goes, as of right now, basketball, hockey, and wrestling are seen as high risk. Indoor track and swim and dive are moderate risk, and alpine ski and Nordic ski are low risk sports. I just say as of now because, as we know, things can change. Um, they may not see be seen as a high risk sport, and the MIA is in contact communication with DESE as well as the EEA on modifications that may need to be met for winter season sports and they will be meeting again in October to discuss any of those modifications that may need to be taking place. So this is the floating season. The MIA gave us now, instead of having three seasons, we have four. So the floating season happens right in between winter and spring. And right now we just have football there. However, if we choose not to have certain sports in the fall for any reason, we would move these sports to the floating season. And then the spring seasons, the regular spring sports, 
Um, like I said, as of now, tennis is low risk, softball, track, baseball, and girls lacrosse is moderate risk, and boys lacrosse are high risk sports. So none of these seasons overlap. Each um, athlete can play all these sports because they don't overlap. As far as modifications go, regardless if you're a low risk sport, a high risk sport, or a Could I ask yeah. you to for one second, before, so what Victoria is going to get into now are the modifications for fall sports, because that's primarily what we're going to talk about tonight is, is the ones that are more proximate. But I just wanted to pause if committee members had any questions on kind of the schedule and the first part of Ms. Stewart's presentation, you know, uh, we could ask it now and then before she gets into the details. Uh -huh. Ms. Spitzer? So um, just a quick question about this concept of a floating season. Is the motivation that hopefully in a few months in, say, February, that conditions in terms of either testing or vaccines or, you know, something outside of the school's control would change? I, otherwise, um, I'm just curious about what why they're considering moving sports to uh, February, I believe it was, where... Um, it might be really hard to play. It would definitely be very difficult to play football outside in February, it seems to me, at least in our area. Yeah, so they're definitely, that was the hope, um, just because football is a high risk sport right now, they don't want to have that one in the fall. Moving sports such as like maybe golf or volleyball, maybe having some type of normal normalcy of the sport um, altogether. So they can actually, once you see some of the modifications, you'll kind of see what I'm talking about because a lot of the modifications don't allow for, you know, the same type of play. Um, and you'll see that later on. So I think that was the whole point of the floating season and at least also to have football for sure, um, hopefully. I, I had a question. Did they, um, I, I read through the, um, the press release and the MIAA website um, on these sports, but I, I didn't see any reference to um, decision making. It, the, the modifications of the sport have been published right now, but how much of that is based or dependent on um, local or regional health metrics, right? So this is saying there's a football in the floating season and there's these modifications, but will things change? So sort of like moving between um, what might be allowed and that I, I can't remember whether it was step one, two, three, four for a high risk sport, does that change at all depending on what your local or regional case count you know, metrics are? Or is that just sort of, it just goes, that, that, that part was confusing to me. Yeah, so I mean, as far as the levels go, they are allowing competition to occur, but no tournaments. So the MIA is not going to have any state tournaments all year round, regardless of if you're in the spring or not. Um, so that is something to keep in mind. However, they are allowing competition. And I believe, Dr. Morris, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the Board of Health has approved of us having volleyball, um, which some schools haven't. So that's another reason for, again, the floating season and um the levels of play. Yeah, so we'll get into volleyball in a little bit, but I think Ms. Stewart's right. So for instance, in the fall sport, that's the only indoor sport. So if you looked at that list, that's the only indoor sport. So there are some boards of health locally that are, uh, and I'm not speaking to ours and Amherst, um, but that are recommending uh, that that move to a floating season because it'd be later on uh, as opposed to the other sports, which are all outdoors for the fall. And so it allows for more local decision making. Now, the hard thing is, obviously, you're affected by what our neighbors do. So if we're going to have inter-school athletics and no one else moves volleyball, and I'm not picking on volleyball, I'm not saying it should or shouldn't move, but any sport moves to the floating season, you need other districts to do the same thing. So it's a little bit of a dance right now. We, do, we have talked about it as superintendents. Uh, we had a conference call today, actually, uh, every Wednesday we meet. Um, so it is a little bit of a moving target right now because uh, it will. There's an interdependence between school committees and superintendents and athletic directors, that's uh, perhaps not as well articulated as you would be if we weren't dealing with all the other stuff. Um, but I think to, to Ms. Stewart's point, that that is another point. Of, part of the floating season is the flexibility to make decisions that perhaps some sports might be better played at another time of year. 
hopefully that helps some. Are there any other uh, questions from the committee? No. Okay. Okay. So um, when talking about modifications, just so you guys know, these are summarized. So there are more in depth and in detail on those hyperlinks, like I said. However, cross country virtual course previews prior to the day of the meet um, versus the typical, you know, in person preview the day before the meet. Um, can occur. Staggered start times uh, with eight to 10 student athletes just to maintain proper social distancing and masks. Masks need to be worn at every start to, at the finish and during the race. But however, if you, you know, get that head start, you can take off that mask. And if you have that social distance, you can take off your mask. But once you see someone and you're close, you have to put it back on. Field hockey, it's a moderate risk sport. Um, a lot of the rules have changed. They have now only seven players on the field, including goalie at a time. Typically, it's 11 players on the field. So there's less players on the field, same size field. Um, and all players must wear face masks as well. They can take it off and take a mask break, they call it, in the guidelines. Uh, they can take a mask break if they're 10 feet away from anyone that's on the field. And they also have no face off. So every it's going to be alternating possessions for each possession. Golf, um, golf's interesting. It is um, low risk. However, we do use a public course, so we just need to keep that in mind when looking at all these modifications. We use Amherst Golf, um, and more people are golfing now. So only essential personnel are permitted on the course. So that means only coaches and student athletes. We don't really have control over that because we don't get the course to ourselves when we have practices and games. There needs to be a single tee start time of 10 minutes between each group. So that's also something we would need to talk to the golf pro about it's basically just the director of the course um, and having that so we can maintain that distance from all the other members that actually use the course. And then masks also need to be worn by players and coaches. Again, it can be taken off if you're 10 feet away from one another. Soccer um, seen as a moderate risk sport. Again, a lot of changes in the rules, no throw-ins, no head balls, no intentional body contact with anyone that includes shoulder to shoulder, backing into one another or any other unintentional body contact. It's also, you're not allowed to have um, goal kicks, drop kicks, punts, or throws by the goalie in the air beyond the midfield line. So everything needs to be touching the ground before it gets to the other side of the field. And again, masks need to be worn and you can take that mask break that we spoke about in the prior, in the slides before. Volleyball, um, as Dr. Moore said, this is our only sport we do have in the fall um, indoors. And some of the modifications change the sport up a little bit. Um, one, the balls do need to be cleaned after each rally and sanitized. The front row players aren't going to have that traditional attack and um, blocking game they normally have because they're going to be three feet away from the net, creating a six foot distant total between team and team to create that social distancing. And masks also need to be worn at all times. And you can take that mask break, but it's definitely harder in that indoor area than it is in the outdoor area to take that break. Uh, we spoke briefly about neighboring schools, but these are just some bullet points of what schools have been doing around us. Um, the PVIC, the conference that we belong to, um, put together a survey and some of them are doing full participation and moved football to floating, which you have to do if you choose to do so. And then no fall sports at all and move them all to floating season. Some just moved soccer and girls volleyball to floating season as well as football. And then some are just unsure. They're still waiting to have their school committee meetings as well. And again, during these times, there are pros and cons to having sports. So I'm going to start with the pros. You know, this, the overall health of the student athletes, the social, the, the social, emotional, mental, the physical health not having sports since March 2020. It's been a long time. And when I say sports, I'm talking about high school sports. Um, I may be biased and I played for Amherst High School, but there's just something special about playing for a community, playing for Amherst and having that across your chest, playing you know, with some of your teammates, um, some of your friends and colleagues from elementary school, and then being competitive with high school sports. There's really nothing like it. Um, also, just the decrease of screen time. We are going to be starting remote. So having you know, a different atmosphere for the kids to be in is definitely big. And again, I do think, even though there's some, you know, mixed feelings about the floating season, 
it is a positive, at least if we choose not to, if you guys don't choose to let us have fall sports, we can move it to the floating season. So that is a positive. Some of the cons and concerns are just, as I said before, kind of is the indoor sport volleyball, just the inability to social distance indoors. It's much more difficult than outdoors. The spread and the potential spread, I should say, of COVID-19 within our community. I'm not just concerned about the you know, student athletes and the coaches, just also who the student athletes coaches go home to every day. Um, we just have to keep that in mind. And transportation, I'm not really speaking about um, extra transportation that's probably needed for the games, you know, having to split up both cross country teams, et cetera. I'm more so speaking about the whole equity issue of kids getting to practices. I know we have some volunteers in the community, which I love. However, we just have to keep that aware, you know, in the back of our minds that some people's transportation to practice was that 7.15, you know, a.m. bus ride to school, them staying after, doing their homework, and then going right to practice. Um, and then lastly, the use of a public facility, so golf. We don't have much control on what goes on at Amherst Golf versus we do have more control of what goes on in our fields, in our gym as well. And these are just the slides that I used. You guys can look at these sources too for further detail. Um, if there's any other questions, feel free. Mr. Demling. Yes, yeah, so thank you very much for the presentation. It's great to have a hurricane at the helm of our uh, athletics department. So. So thank, thank you for this information. Um, I'm, I'm glad that we don't have to vote tonight um, because I, I while I, I am very much on board with all the pros that you've listed and, and all the pros, by the way, that uh, parents and public and, and coaches have, have sent in to us recently about the pros of sports, the, the physical, mental, emotional um, benefits, especially for our kids who, um, based on our current phasing model, aren't gonna be in the buildings until November. Um, I, th I think for me, and this is just a general comment, like the, the, the pros are, are pretty well established, um, but like everything in COVID for the school committee, nothing is easy here. And, and I, I think you've, you've already hit on a couple of the major uh, concerns that I think we need to, as, as much as we can, um, come up with, with what's, what's the best solution to solve. And I don't think any, a lot of these cons are completely solvable, but I think, I think with the limited amount of time we have, we need to get it. As, as good as we can. So the transportation inequity is a big one, right? Um, the, there's there's no way around it that we're not gonna be running buses in the early afternoon and the very late afternoon before and after practices and games. And so kids are gonna have to have their own transportation. And this, so this is going to exclude families and students that cannot find their own transportation. That might be a small number of students. And I'm sure um, the, the parents and volunteers uh, among those teams are gonna do the best to support each other. and you know, carpool and socially distanced roll down the windows kind of way. And, um, and, and, you know, I'm, I hope that that happens. Um, but I, I, th I think we do need to think about is, is, are there ways that we can help informally organize that in, in a, in a safe way, right. In a, a way that we can encourage that. So that's, that's like number one on my list of concerns. Um, number two, and I don't think this is solvable and, and, it, and I just have to say this publicly, um, because I feel like a big part of transparency as a public official is being honest. Um, the, the, the juxtaposition for the first two weeks of school, so from mid-September to October 1st, of having kids playing sports, which is a very valuable, positive thing, um, and yet having a, a certain subset of, of our students, our high-need students, who we know can't access remote learning, unable to access in-person learning for those first two weeks of school until 10-1, it it feels um, that that feel that's that's very hard. <laughs> it's a hard juxtaposition for me to hold. Um, I don't think there's a way to solve that. I, I know it's only two weeks. These kids are getting back in on ten one, um, and maybe we'll talk a little bit more about but what those kids can get in those two weeks. You know, later on in the meeting. But um, I just have to state it out there that that's that's a hard thing. I don't think it's a reason not to move forward with sports, but but it is something that's that's in top of my mind. Um, the volleyball thing, I think, is very well stated. Um, I read through all the sport by sport guidance. That's definitely the one that stands out like a sore thumb. Um, the the fact that the state doesn't uh, classify it as high risk, I, I think, is a mistake, <laughs> given that it's the only indoor sport, um, and um, that they really don't say anything about um, what else you should you should be doing, given that it's indoor, is is concerning to me. So I would I would want to hear 
more from public health officials and from Dr. Morris and, and our, our own, um, you know, uh, resources about, about what the guidance is on that. Um, I'm not surprised that other local health officials have, have advised against that. Um, and then the other detail that stood out to me that I guess that has come up in another topic on school committees is this idea of gaiters, right? So gaiters being these, these, these thinner masks and, and throughout the MIA guidance, it says, you know, gaiters are acceptable. And, and I get that. If, if you are a young person and you are running around at top cardio output, you want a thin layer because it's pretty uncomfortable to engage in a high activity. And yet there's, there's this other idea, right, that if we're trying to maximize safety and you're turning the dials down in some of the other variables, like, like you're, you're going to be frequently violating the social distancing and you are uh, in, involved in very heavy uh, input and output cardio activity, um, you might want to consider turning the dial up on some of the other uh, safety guidelines, like the mask requirement. So um, I found that kind of a concerning detail uh, in terms of safety. So um, the special ed juxtaposition, I don't think there's anything we can do to solve that. I think that's just, uh, uh, but the other concerns that I brought up, if there's some details that we come back next week, whether it's Dr. Morris, it's Consolino, uh, um, I'd be interested um, before, but that being said, at this moment, my current disposition is to vote in favor of everything except for volleyball, but I'm open to changing my mind and I, I am interested to hear what, what everyone else has to say um, this, this week and next. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Dr. Morris. Yeah, I think the only thing I'll say is uh, I want to emphasize something Ms. Stewart said uh, about uh, golf. And we have been in touch with Ms. Consolino about that. And, and she actually is, has talked to us a bit about volleyball and the concerns around that. But I think the golf piece that Ms. Stewart said is this, it's on a public course. Uh, the public course wouldn't have the same rules for everyone on the public course as it has for our student athletes. So that is, um, while, the, while it's low risk in the overall context, it is a real concern for us about how many people are playing golf um, and that they don't have the same rules as our student athletes have. So I think out of the two sports, and Ms. Stewart can correct me if I'm wrong, but those are the two that stand out to us, that there's a variable um, that's different than the others. You know, uh, I'm not saying that, you know, soccer is not medium risk, but it's on our field. We can control who's there. And I think that's the piece around the golf that, makes us, you know, a bit anxious um, is that uh, there's variables we can't control. It's not our golf course. And um, so that's just another one to Mr. Demling's point about, you know, um, kind of where we feel more comfortable and where we feel less comfortable. Ms. Stewart, would you agree with that? Yeah, I agree for sure. Ms. Spitzer, I think I saw your hand up earlier. Yeah, no, I thank you. Um, I guess one of my questions had to also go back to the volleyball um, issue. And um, I was curious also about the sports where we might be training in, say, the locker rooms or the gym. I mean, all of these spaces, I don't think, um, you know, we've been paying really close attention to ventilation in our classrooms, restricting, you know, students to being only in places with windows and proper ventilation. So it's been a long time since I've been in you know, the, the high school gym or locker rooms. I'm just curious if, were those part of the ventilation study that we're gonna be seeing in a little bit, or have we looked at the ventilation in the spaces that would be required for opening um, up to volleyball and also to the other sports that might require kids to um, be in the building? So I think I can take that one, Ms. Stewart, um, which is those were those spaces were not tested. Um, and I think the general theme that I've heard from other superintendents, with the exception of perhaps volleyball, but for outdoor sports is to use those spaces sparingly um, because the students aren't coming from school. The idea is that they would come ready to play um, and they would you know, perhaps use bathrooms, uh, which we would expect, but that it wouldn't be the typical locker room experience that student athletes have had before that they would you know, let's say for field hockey, they would come, they'd go straight to the field, um, dressed, ready to play, um, and they would go back in their cars and go home. They wouldn't come in for changing or, you know, any of that kind of thing, uh, given the context. Um, so really the only use would be bathrooms, but not locker rooms. Volleyball is the one piece where it gets a little more complicated. Students can still show up uh, ready to play, but because it is indoors, it, it adds a variable that I think... Um, you know, in talking to the health folks, there are some concerns about. We have not gotten a directive not to play volleyball from our health department, but um, there's some uh, feelings um, 
that it um, the nature of being inside adds a layer of risk that's not present in the other sports. And I just want to add to um, the indoor space, our trainers also indoors. Um, however, at our athletic director meeting today, we spoke about even maybe putting like an outdoor tent for our trainer to be out there outside to limit the amount of time people are indoors as well. So that's just something that people are doing too. Um, Ms. Stancer. Um, have you had any conversation yet with the people at the Amherst Golf Course to understand what their current rules are and whether members would be on the course at the same time as the Amherst players? Yes, I have been in conversation um, with them and volunteers that work there as well. Um, and people will definitely be on the course. They actually have had an increase of members um, join the course this year, which is great for them, but it's also um, a little bit of a bummer because they don't clear the course for us to practice and have games and matches. I have um, a, a couple questions and some comments also. Um, so I guess first, first my quick questions on the, um, we, because we're, we're, we have to, we, the school committee has to vote on, on the season because we're starting the year remote. Would that, does that, are we voting on the fall season only? Or are we voting on all sports? Um, are we, if, if we have to sometime, sometime between now and when we, when we get to the winter season, if we've had, presumably we're in in-person learning and then we close, would we then have to also vote on winter sports? Or if we're in-person learning by then, we don't actually vote on winter sports, I guess, like, what are we actually voting on and what is the decision process for beyond fall sports? So as of right now, you guys would be just going on about fall sports. None of the modifications or rules are out for the winter sports and the other sports to follow other than we'll have football in the floating season. That's the only thing that would stay the same um, that you guys can't really change. Got it. Thank you. Um, so some some other thoughts and, and just talking about sort of the use of, of locker rooms, my both of my kids have been participating in different sports throughout the summer and, and um, club sports. And, you know, even with the pool, they, they have to walk, go to the pool in their bathing suits. They're not allowed in the locker rooms. And um, so for a lot of the young athletes, I think they're they're used to this idea. I mean, even the hockey player, you know, going to the, the rink in full gear and, you know, <laughs> changing in the parking lot. I mean, right now it's August in, in January, that might be challenging, but it is very common. And, and, you know, the kids, because they, they want to play their sport, it, it works pretty well. So they, they sort of do what they need to do to, to be able to play. Um, but I, I will echo and sort of build on Mr. Demling's comments and concerns about how it, 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 it just doesn't sit well um, from a school committee perspective that we are, um, you know, presumably voting on sports. And you know, if we were to say yes to to a fall season, that we're we're at the same time leaving our high needs students, our, our high needs students, sort of not having any in person learning until at the earliest October first, and that just really is challenging to sort of accept. And again, I, I, I agree with Mr. Demling and what some of the community has said in public comment that that's not necessarily a reason to say no to sports because of the many, many reasons um, that you cited, Ms. Stewart, for all the all the, all the the obvious pros and benefits of, of participation in sports. Um, but it's really, really hard to sort of, you know, think about letting down sort of the, our most vulnerable students um, in, in that sense um, at the same time that we're doing this and, and, and to take that transparency and honesty further as, as one community member noted in their public comment, the difference here is, is not a difference in the school committee, but a difference in sort of the stakeholders that are involved in, in making it happen. And we don't have a union um, that we, that we're dealing with when we're talking about sports. Um, and that's that's not a statement of positive or negative. That's just a, simply a statement of sort of how how we're able to consider um, even consider sports at this point. Um, 
And I, I do have concerns about the transportation equity. I do having had kids that participated in high school sports and seeing sort of that camaraderie and the the parent support of all of the other athletes. I I, I do feel that if, it's, if we make a if the teams and the coaches can make that effort to to coordinate the the transportation, that will be able to happen. So I would just hope that we we commit to making sure that. We're not leaving students out because of um, transportation. And one one thought that I did have, though, um, because of the challenge, be because so many of these sports that we're looking at for fall are outdoors and are lower risk, um, is there opportunity for us to expand participation in some way? Um, I know we have reduced reduced um, fees for certain sports um, with reduced and um, free and reduced lunch. Um, families and we have discounts for um, multiple children that are in one family that are playing sports. And I wonder if we can sort of build on that a little bit to enable greater participation in sports so that more students are able to get the benefits um, of these and expanding what we think about and at least for the, you know, that level one of play, which is the the conditioning and the 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 gameplay that all of the things that sort of team building, um, if we can sort of make that more accessible to more students um, for just for all of the benefits that you've cited. Um, so I guess that's sort of a comment and a question. <laughs> um, I don't know if you've given that any thought, but that's um, one hope. And before you answer that, um, my last thought is on the gators. Um, I think, you know, uh, Mr. Dibbling cited the single layer. I have seen um, multiple layers and one of the, the other comment one of my kids' sports actually bought gaiters for all of their students because they have to, all of their players, because they have to wear the, the gaiters on um, on the ice. So having, you know, hurricane gaiters that are multiple layers and providing them to all the team, all of the players on, on different teams might be, might be a way to, to enable that. And then also help in, help enforce um, the, that sort of protocol. Um, but back to the question about the expanding participation. Do we, have you given any thoughts to, particularly for some of the sports like a cross country, or um, or soccer that might require less less equipment um, and less sort of training? Um, you know, if they, if they're new to the sport in high school or middle school, um, are there ways that we can build on that? Yeah, and I we typically have strength and conditioning in the fall. I just didn't put these on the that on the slide because that's not an MIA sport. Um, even though that's indoors, we could maybe make some type of like outdoor workout type of thing for students also to participate in. Um, they are allowing out of season coaching. I think that was mostly for you know all the football players that aren't going to have a season this fall um, to allow their coach to do some sort of you know conditioning or, um, you know, whatever kind of drills that he's able to put in um, that fit all the guidelines and do that and have that opportunity. Uh, but we normally do have like a strength and conditioning and be, maybe like looking for something that's not indoors in that, you know, in the weight room, maybe, you know, using the hills and putting equipment outside, that could be an idea as well. But normally we do have a lot of um, boys soccer. We normally have over, you know, it's about 60 people try out, 60 boys try out, you know, our girls soccer team. We have two teams as well. And our cross country, there's a good turnout normally for them. So I wouldn't be surprised if more people would join, maybe even some football players that don't actually have a season will try a sport out as well. Mr. Sullivan. Yes, thank you, Mr. Demling, for um, talking about the inequities. Because I, you know, the transportation is one of my big ones. Being out here in Shutesbury, and also the, you know, starting sports and not having any students in the school is a big, tough. As everyone has mentioned, is a tough issue. And um, you answered my question. I was going to ask about football. If they'd be allowed to do some sort of training in the the fall non-season, and you. You answered that one. And yeah, um, more middle school, in, you know, intramurals. We, I mean, we really should look into doing that because, you know, the soccer is more, the sports are for high school students 
And we really should encourage as many middle school students to get outside and play as we can. Um, let's see that. Oh, my other, my volleyball question. If we were to give the thumbs up to volleyball and find out that we're the only school that wants to do it in the fall, would we have to re-vote or would that, could that just get moved to the floating season? Um, that could just get moved to the floating season. But as, um, you know, like I said before, I had my athletic director meeting this morning and it's almost like 50-50 to be honest with you. However, like some people that are actually in our league, um, they are already moving to the floating season versus like Longmeadow, their go for volleyball. Um, some schools are just a go. So it's, that's actually like a sport that's split, but there's enough. If we had to go to the floating season, we would have enough people to play um, as well as if we stayed um, during the season as well. Ms. Seeger. So in, in thinking about this, um, Transportation for me is probably the highest concern that I have in this, especially coming from Leverett as well, where um, like in Shootsbury, the kids are coming from probably a further distance. Um, I, I'm also thinking about the different forces at play between the inequity of not having anybody in the schools and then having sports happening. And, to, and in my mind, there, there's just very different forces at play there. Um, and with the students playing sports, you know, we hear more and more about the mental health concerns we have with families having their children at home all the time and not seeing people. And, um, you know, I watch my own kids. Are they getting outside enough? Are they exercising enough and stuff like that? So, you know, I'm concerned, too, that if because there aren't because we're not having um, students in school that we decide not to have sports, I, I don't think that's um, going to be helpful. You know, it is a concern. It is, it is a sort of oddity when you look at it and you say, well, you're not having anybody in the school, but you're having sports. But I really do feel like there's going to be so much benefit to having the students um, playing sports that that we really should consider allowing that to happen. The bigger thing for me is the transportation and how do you make it fair um, so that those who want to play can actually get there. And I love the idea of expanding it to um, a bigger group of kids who might maybe not normally do this or um, just opening it up more. Um, so I just wanted to share those thoughts. Mr. Demling. Yeah, I just briefly wanted to second what Ms. McDonald and Ms. Seeger um, both, both said about ex the expansion. This idea that like, ki like kids that like a, a, maybe like the lowest bar activity, I, I guess cross I ran cross country, so I'm not saying it's a non-skill sport, but but the <laughs> but like the lowest sort of a bar activity, whether that's like soccer or or ultimate or some kind of like activity where a kid might not normally do sports, but if they've been cooped up for six months, and then we have this this accessible uh, activity um, uh, where they might not, you know, they might not make the a, you know the a high school grade soccer team or or, or some other thing, but that the, there's something some intramural level. Um, that you know that maybe that's something that that, that would be accessible for a couple months. I, it's I I, I I do also do understand though the challenge with with creative ideas that are given really late and the implementation challenges with with solving those. So it's very easy to throw these off the cuff and then say, here you go, Victoria. Like have fun implementing that for the next few weeks. So um, you know, um it devils in the details, obviously, and I understand the pragmatic challenges, but um uh you know. I just wanted to say, I think that's a great, it's a great idea. Ms. Spitzer, is your hand up? Yeah. So kind of, um, I just want to, I, I kind of led in with my ventilation question and didn't get a chance to kind of weigh in on, on my thoughts, but I, I had some um, comments as well. And one is that I, I totally agree that the mental health benefits from being able to exercise and also have a social connection with your peers is really important. I guess as somebody who, you know, in high school was not much of an athlete at all. I, it's not only the inequity I see against like the, have in the schools closed and the transportation issues, but there are also kids who the, the thing they get excited about, the thing that motivates them might be, you know, I, I was on debate team, you know, like, like it wasn't athletic, but it was a social activity. I went to, it happened after school and it gave me something to get excited about um, as a kid. So I know we're not going to decide on that now, but the other thing that makes me feel kind of uncomfortable, like I, there, there are health reasons we can't do a lot of the dramatic arts and um, and singing and you know the chorus and 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 other after school activities. But I want us to be aware that there are a lot of after school activities that potentially could be moved outdoors and 
modified in other low risk ways. And all of these other challenges around transportation and equity that we're talking about are, are also present for these ones. So I guess if, if we make a vote on this one, I just want to make sure we don't forget all the kids who their reason to get excited to go to school is an after school club that doesn't involve athletics. So as much as I want to open up athletics to as many people as possible, because I, I really believe now I've become a bit of an athlete, like it helps my mental health a lot. Um, but I don't think it's the only thing that, that, and some kids are just not able to participate in sports for physical you know, reasons that I think we all need to, to be aware of too. It's not just the economic, there are other um, inequities. Um, so after saying all of that, I, I have a question about, um, you know, when I'm often LSSC, um, has intramural sports and often they're using our, sorry, um, um, anyways, so um, other other things that are happening at, through LSSC, I know have been put on hold, like the pools are open, but some of the other, th so I'm wondering, are is that still the case that high school students could be playing like soccer or um, intramural softball, for example? I remember when I was a kid, that was an option. Um, will that be an option and will we be allowing other like non-school members to be on our fields or has that um, not been decided yet? Um, I can, I don't know if Dr. Morris, you want to speak on it, but I can speak on it a little bit. As of right now, there's no one using our fields um, that we have, which are the ones I know they're separated. So that makes it a little complicated when people drive by the high school and see people on the football and baseball field and softball field, those aren't our fields. Um, they shouldn't be on our fields right now, I guess I should say, but there's nothing blocking them from going on to our fields. Um, and But yeah, there are, you know, baseball leagues and other leagues happening that LSE is running still. But as of right now, they shouldn't be using our um, facilities. Like there's no indoor basketball or anything that they normally use as well. Yep. Yeah. And the only thing I'll add is that, yeah, there are, I, I, the town has informed us that they are, they have approved certain youth leagues to use the town owned fields, uh, particularly the ones that Ms. Stewart said, um, but not on uh, the fields that are on the region. Region own land, excuse me. Yeah. Any other comments, um, thoughts or questions? I just want to state, I heard you guys talk about gators a little bit. That's also another thing that came up today um, in my meeting, and some schools have voted not to allow Gators. That's also another option if you guys don't feel comfortable with Gators. You can just tell student athletes that they can't wear Gators and they have to wear a mask. Um, I don't think they would mind having to do that, but that was a good Because we can always make you know our rules higher than the MIA, like our grades and our academic rules. You know We have higher expectations than, than the MIA, but we do at least have to meet their guidelines at least. Okay, thank you. So as um, Dr. Morris said, um, we're we're not not expecting or um, uh, planning to take a vote tonight. So um, we will come back again, and if there's other questions, we can do that. But if you, I'll, I'll give everybody one last shot to ask a question while we have Ms. Stewart here. Um, if anybody has any more questions. not seeing any. Okay. Great. All right. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. All right. Bye. Bye. Okay. Um, so moving back to item one on our agenda, which is, uh, so I'm now going to um, move that we enter into executive session to dis discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation of APEA, UFCW, APAA, and AFSCME, if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigation position of the public body, and the chair also declares, I declare, with the intention of returning to open session. Is there a second? Second. Lord, second. Moved by McDonald, uh, second by Lauren. We'll take a roll call vote on this. Uh, Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Ms. Kenny. Kenny, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Seeger. Seeger, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. 
Ms. Stancer? Answer aye. Mr. Sullivan? Sullivan, aye. And McDonald, aye. So we will now uh, move into executive. I'll call to order this meeting of the Amherst School Committee at 8.15 p.m. And we'll start with a roll call um, attendance. Um, um, oh, Mr. Demling. Hi. Um, Hi. Present, are you present? Uh, yes. <laughs> Mr. Harrington. Present. Ms. Lord. Lord present. Ms. Spitzer. Ms. Spitzer present. And McDonald present. The Amherst School Committee is to order. Chair Hall. All right, seeing the presence of the quorum, I'll call to order this meeting of the Pelham School Committee at 8.16 p.m. And I'll start with roll call attendance. Ms. Kenny. Ms. Kenny present. Ms. Stancer. Answer present. Mr. Menino. Menino present. Ms. Barlow. Barlow present. And Hall present. So um, we are starting with um, approving our minutes from, we have minutes from August 6th in our packet but not the other dates. So we'll, we'll at least uh, work through August 6th. Anyway, welcome, um, Ms. Gripko. Ms. Stancer. Um, a couple of, I think just uh, typos probably in, um, in, in item number six, the last paragraph, it says the plan we're voting. I think it should be the plan we were voting or are voting. The plan we are voting. And in number 9A, the first paragraph, last line, I think the word grave should be grade. <laughs> yeah. And I think, and uh, Ms. Hall can correct me if I'm wrong, in number 9B, um, paragraph 4, the second sentence, it says calling the ARPS committee to order. I think that should be the Pelham committee. Ms. Hall? Yes, so thanks, Ms. Stancer. Yeah, it does. It says that I that I moved, yeah. uh, made the motion on behalf of the region, and it references Mr. Sullivan. Um, and then on the following page, it says that I moved to extend the meeting. So those, that just needs to be cleaned up to reference that it was Pelham, and I did not move to extend the meeting, because we don't have to. Mr. Demling, and then Ms. Kenny. On uh, item 9A, page six, top paragraph, uh, the sentence in the middle, Mr. Demling agreed that the data is murky and that the major limitation of the survey is that we do not know why people chose the option they did. Um, I went back and looked at the tape. Um, and basically, uh, what I said was Mr. Demling agreed that, uh, Mr. Demling, uh, actually, sorry, I'm gonna have to go to what I said. <laughs> um, uh, I might not agree that the data is completely murky. I do feel like there's a general trend towards support for Model 2. However, um, that's, to make this simple, <laughs> the change that I would that would still would make the minutes accurate without adding more would just be to change this to Mr. Demling agreed that a major limitation of the survey is that we don't know why people choose the option they did. So just changing, um, striking that the data is murky and that the just to a so the the new sentence mr demling agreed that a major limitation of the survey is that we don't know is that clear sorry if that was confusing miss kenny i was there i was in attendance so oh. i'm not listening on the top um and then I, 
think maybe that was it that I saw for myself. Okay. Mr. Harrington. Yeah, so um, in section 9B, towards the end of uh, the fourth paragraph, it says, Mr. Harrington said on page 16, if we could add language around by enforcing health measures. I think I asked if we could add language enforce, or around enforcing health measures. I think that would be the more accurate. Mm-hmm. Ms. Kenny? Um, when Mr. Harrington asked about, I thought if you, you, he asked about restorative justice. I didn't go back and look at the tapes, but I thought that's what we had talked about. Maybe it wasn't the same day. Right, right, as, as opposed to having like punitive measures, right. Any other um, updates, changes, corrections? Seeing none. Um, so I, I will move for the region to approve the minutes from of our uh, joint meeting on Thursday, August 6th. Is there a second from the region? I'll second, Spitzer. We'll do a roll call vote. Mr. Demling? Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington? Harrington, aye, sorry. Ms. Kenny? Kenny, aye. Ms. Lord? Lord, aye. Ms. Seeger? Seeger, aye. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer, aye. Ms. Stancer? Answer aye. Mr. Sullivan? Sullivan, aye. Mr. McDonald, aye. The motion passes uh, nine to zero. Would someone like to make a motion for Amherst? I move to approve the minutes of August 6, 2020. Second. Moved by Spitzer, second by Harrington. Roll call vote. Mr. Demling? Demling, aye. Um, Ms. Lord? Lord, I. Mr. Harrington? Harrington uh -oh, I. Did you hear me? Lord, I? Yes, we did. Sorry. And Harrington, I. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer, I. And McDonald, I. Um, the motion passes five to zero. Dr. Morris, could you remind us in chat how we, um, what the key controls are for unmuting ourselves? <laughs> Thank you. Chair Hall. Um, I will make a motion for Pelham to adopt, to approve the minutes of August 6th, 2020. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Stancer. Uh, okay, roll call vote, Ms. Kenny. Kenny, aye. Ms. Stancer? Ms. Stancer, aye. Ms. Barlow? Barlow, aye. Mr. Menino? Menino, aye. And Hall, aye. Okay. Um, now we move on to um, public comment, and we have um, two voice messages and um, some written comment as well. And for those that um, hadn't tuned in for the Regional School Committee, um, public comment. Um, I did not get this um, over to the um, Sasha in order to get it posted to the website before the meeting. But for those that would like to um, read on their own, um, I did post it on my school committee Facebook page um, if you would like to access the actual um, public comment document. So we'll start with the voice message. Uh, Mr. Menino, can you mute yourself, please? Oh, you are. I'm Heather Sheldon, speaking on behalf of the board of the Special Education Parent Advisory Council. 
The joint statement between the district and APEA announcing the two-week delay to the start of in-person learning stated, we have, a degree, we have agreed on some broad parameters that we believe will make distance learning more meaningful for all children in the district. While CSEC agrees that distance learning can be made more meaningful for many of our students, it is flatly false to claim that distance learning can be meaningful for all children in the district. On Monday, CPEC sent a survey to all students in our district with an Individualized Education Plan, or IEP. We have had over 70 responses so far. We, in, we are encouraged to hear that many families report that since in-person instruction ceased last March, their students have, re, have maintained or even gained skills. Sadly, though, this is not a uniform condition. A significant portion of families report that their student has lost important skills. Some families reported that their student is in crisis. Please remember these families as you continue to make plans for the school year. We will share full resort we will share full results from the survey with you after we have fully compiled them. Thank you. Hello, my name is Carol Gray, and I'm giving a comment about the remote learning. Uh, I have a student a son who's in 10th grade, and I was very concerned last spring that there was no synchronous classes. We were all told that there would be regular synchronous classes this fall, and I read that part of the union bargaining demands had initially said that they would not be providing synchronous instruction this really, really concerns me. I, I know other states where kids have, even in the last spring, were doing 9 to 12 regular Zoom classes on a daily basis, meeting with all their teachers, and we should be able to do this. We have an excellent school system, and yet we've really fallen short for our children. I would still like to hear what the plan is for remote learning. I understand there are blocks designated, but I'd like to know, are there going to be synchronous classes with each teacher each day for each block? I think this is what our kids need, and it was sorely absent last spring, and we were promised that's what would be happening for the fall. Um, I have listened to the town halls. We've been, I've been reading the materials, but I so far haven't heard any commitment that there will be synchronous classes with each teacher each day. And I really hope that will be happening. Thank you. Can folks see that document on the screen now? Okay.
This is um, this comment is just the transcript of the um, voice message that we heard. And as mentioned, is included in the in the document that will be posted on um, the regional school, school committee agendas webpage on the arps.org website. So that concludes um, public comment. Um, so we'll move, uh, turn it over to Dr. Morris for the superintendent's update at this point. Sure, so it'll be brief because most of my updates fall under the fall 2020 uh, agenda item, but I have four. Um, and all of them, nice news. So nice to have nice updates. So the first one and, and most prevalent because it's a topic that this committee, these committees have talked about recently is um, a couple of days ago, I guess it was Monday, we got a an email um, that the uh, United States Food um, Agriculture um, Department has extended the food waiver so that we can extend our food sites within the community through December 31st. So you know, as you know, we've built alternate plans of how to manage that, but we're glad not to need them, that we can continue uh, doing what we've been doing that's been very effective of getting meals to families through uh, the rest of this calendar year. So, you know, I want to thank, uh, so a couple of you were involved in that advocacy, so thank you for getting involved in it, and I'm glad that we're uh, we're in a better place with that, um, not needing to adjust our other programming. Second is that this week, as you know, staff were, um, uh, invited to be in buildings to do the professional development they have not required but it's been great i've been to three different buildings and uh, been able to see staff and again and obviously the safe socially distanced way say hi to people and and have conversations and uh, you know it feels better to have our school buildings with teachers in it and paraeducators and other folks uh, it's been great hanging out with custodians and, and other administrators for the last couple months who have been in, but it feels really nice to have uh, other folks occupying some spaces in the building. So and that's been great. Obviously, staff have been um, also able to access it from home, but for some staff, you know, being away from home has been a really positive thing. Just, you know, people are home a lot these days, uh, but also accessing the technology and the Wi-Fi and, and, and all those pieces. The third thing is yesterday, as you know, was primary day and uh, for the Amherst folks um, and the regional folks too, uh, our spaces were used. I got to visit Crocker Farm as well as the high school's voting area. Uh, I got to talk to constables, uh, walk around with um, you know, principal at Crocker Farm. Incredibly smooth. I wanna thank the town. It was, it was incredibly well staffed. Um, I'm really glad at Crocker Farm where it moved to. It's just a much better site all around. It's much less, even if it was a day where students were there sometime in the future, obviously not now. It just, it's much less getting in the way. Um, so kicking ourselves for having never changed that um, site uh, earlier, but uh, really wanna thank the town and thank voters for following it. The signage worked, you know, there weren't too many people, there was no one wandering, but there weren't too many people confused by it and, and the town did a fantastic job. So uh, thanks everyone for that. It went um, better than I would have, um, would have thought it would in terms of clarity, given that there were new sites, both the high school being a new site altogether, but also Crocker Farm being in a different location at the opposite side of the building. And my last one is that we had new teacher orientation last week. Um, uh, it was great to meet them with a smaller group of new teachers than we've had in some time, um, but a really, you know, great to meet them. And we'll share kind of data in the fall about, you know, HR and diversity um that we're, we'll be proud to share but also want to thank the chamber of commerce and other folks who donated goodie bags um as they always did this year was harder to do but they got a lot of donations so that our new new teachers got welcomed into not just the district but to the larger community and, and kudos to tim sheehan for organizing uh some really valuable experiences for those new folks when they come so we're glad to have them they're going to add a tremendous amount to our district and Again, I have lots more updates, but they'll be uh, they'll, they'll go in the fall 2020 uh, agenda bucket a little later tonight. Great. Any questions uh, or comments for Dr. Morris? Mr. Sullivan. Question about the food distribution. Without the UMass students being on campus, does that mean the baby Burke is gonna continue to help? At least temporarily, we're working on what that means. There are students on campus, just significantly fewer um, in terms of UMass. And so we are trying to work out those details. Um, but um, 
you know, we're just happy that uh, we got that news Monday. And now we're, you know, Mr. Gallo Connell, you met last time, is working out those kind of details. But UMass has con contributed uh, or committed to helping as much as they can, given that they have reduced capacity, as you noted. Ms. Stancer. Um, so what about the funding? Um, is that going to be the money that the town said they would provide for those meals? So since since that waiver got extended, it'll be like this spring where we get reimbursed per meal without having to do the long verification process or charge people meals. It's like our summer meals program. So it'll 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 continue like it did in the spring, which financially worked out okay for us. And I'm I'm sorry, but did that who actually funded the meals? So the government does. They reimburse us for the meals as part of the food juice lunch program. Okay, thank you. Yep, sorry I wasn't more clear about that before. My mistake. Any more questions? Okay. Okay. We'll move on to um, chair's update. Um, I, I don't have an update other than I um, wanted to just say um, uh, thank you and um, for everybody who stepped in last week to help out when um, I had such poor Wi-Fi. And also um, to note that I was in error. I had actually received an email from Ms. Seeger stating that she had a conflict on that night. So I apologize for Ms. Seeger for saying that actually I did not know that anybody uh, uh, could not come. So um, apologies for that. Um, Chair Hall, do you have any um, updates? I don't, thank you. Does, um, are there any announcements for, oh, uh, Ms. Lord. Yes, thank you, Chair McDonald. Mm -hmm. I would like gladly and triumphantly announce our school equity task force meeting next Wednesday at 6 a.m. Welcome PM? all, thank you. Oh, 6 p.m., thank you all. <laughs> Mr. Demling. Yes, and we have our first uh, CPAC meeting of the school year uh, this Friday, September 4th at 9 a.m. Uh, so CPAC, Special Ed Parent Advisory Council, it's open to everyone in the public, uh, but it's uh, here for uh, parents of students with disabilities, if kids on IEP, or if you have concerns. Um, so easiest way to get that link is just email CPAC at SEPAC at arps.org. You can also find ARPS CPAC on Facebook. Uh, and uh, be happy to help you out. And um, there you go. Ms. Spitzer. And this is more of a specific to the Amherst Committee, but there is a JCP, JCPC meeting um, coming up on Wednesday that Mr. Demling and I will be attending and looking forward to giving you updates on um, the next meeting. And that's, sorry, that's at Wednesday at 5.30 to 7.30. Thank you. And I'll make one more announcement. Um, uh, there is a virtual community forum tomorrow sponsored by the Town Gown Fall Reopening Group. Um, that is tomorrow at 5.30 p.m. online. Um, folks from the, um, it's been shared a lot on Facebook, um, but just uh, calling that out. Um, I think the deadline to submit questions ahead of time is passed, um, but that will also be streamed, I believe, on YouTube Live. Any other announcements? No, okay. Uh, so we'll move on to our new and continuing business and um, we'll begin with the fall 2020 update. Um, so for that, I will hand it back over to Dr. Morris. Um, sure, I've got a, uh, a number of uh, things to share. It's not a presentation like, a, you know, in terms of slides, but a variety of topics. Um, so I will start with virtual schedules. Um, so we are finalizing those. Um, I think to, to answer some questions that we've got, not just tonight, but in other meetings, there will be synchronous meetings every day uh, for every student. Uh, we believe in that. And some of that, we're still gathering staff feedbacks. Uh, next, early next week, we should have that all wrapped up. Um, so there's more clarity coming. But we believe in daily synchronous instruction and core content areas. Uh, we've been doing professional development with um, an online school, actually a non-for-profit school, and um, 
they've been great about helping us think about what needs to be synchronous, what needs to be asynchronous, and and really re-envisioning what distance learning means. Uh, what we know from them and from research is uh, trying to replace the in-person experience with the online experience, like one for one. It's a really different format, and that doesn't make a tremendous uh, amount of impact as we'd want. And synchronous instruction is is incredibly important. Um, it, you know, for instance, you know, one of the things that I shared on, on one of the PD sessions I was a part of today is we know that not all caregiver or not all parents and caregivers, primary caregivers, will be with their child at home um, the whole time. That you know, I think some of the concerns about screen time for me, it's it's not necessarily how much screen time; it's which screens are students watching. Are they watching the screens with their teacher? Um, or working with other students, or are they watching the screens on their television? Because, you know, it's as opposed to uh, the spring, there's going to be a lot more parents and guardians who are going to be needing to work, and frankly, in not necessarily in the home, but even those who are in the home. So we really do need to rely on our staff members to be providing that instruction instead of providing resources. You know, it's just some national statistics, because I think they're important from an equity approach, as um, our former Secretary of Education, John King, cited these recently. Um, there are huge disparities, uh, racial disparities, on who can choose to work or who has the capacity to work from home versus who has to show up in buildings. Um, so 20%, only 20% of African Americans in the workforce in this country can work from home. Only 17% of Latinos in the workforce can work from home in the United States. And for white families, it's an incredibly higher number. And so, you know, we do, we know that uh, for many families of every race, but, but again, there's those disparities. It may be cousins, it may be older siblings who are uh, you know, providing childcare for younger kids. And so we really need to, uh, need to provide that high quality instruction that we do, that, that we're planning to. And, and again, at the elementary level in particular, trying to focus that on small groups because that's how students learn best. But even at the middle school, high school level, uh, what we've learned is that's really critical. Um, you know, it's interesting looking at uh, some other states. So Maryland's like mandating live instructional hours and. What you notice is actually uh, maybe uh, the opposite of what you think might be true, that a lot of places who are doing that are having more live instruction for elementary students than secondary students. And while that sounds counterintuitive, at the secondary level, there could be a small class session, students do work, and they may be working in groups without a teacher because they're, they're able to be more independent, whereas at the elementary level, again, that's a little bit harder. Um, so we're actively working on it. And, and another reason we feel so strongly about having a sufficient amount of synchronous instruction is that learning we believe is a and i think there's enough research on it is 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 a collaborative exercise that you know that it's learning one-on-one -on -one versus learning in a group offers a substantially different experience and what we found out from students last spring is they were missing that personal connection if you remember the there was a survey given in the student piece uh, everyone would believe there was more, all three groups, stakeholder groups, talked about needing to have more synchronous instruction. But the students in particular talked about it really increasing their motivation. Um, and so we're going to provide that for them and promote the personal connections and relationships that students won't have with their teachers like they did last spring because they haven't met them before. Um, they don't have six months of experience. So we are going to try to balance those. We want to make sure that we're providing um, sufficient resources for families. We'll be doing more parent trainings. Um, on the different, you know, technology tools that'll start next week uh, and be ongoing. But we also want to make sure that we're providing uh, real instruction for students because we know that we want to um, that we can't assume or expect that uh, a parent, guardian, or an adult will be next to them the full time working with them on their learning. Uh, we know that's actually not the case. Uh, the, that links into the professional development. We've been working with a, um, an organization, as I said, called GOA. Um, some of the focus has been about creating a welcome page, welcome video, how to humanize an online space for students. Uh, at the secondary level, there's a boot camp that they're, they're doing, which is, is focused on these in the elementary. Uh, it's a little more uh, less focused. Uh, it's not a boot camp, but the principals have taken on leadership roles to advance the learning. Uh, today, there was a session on transferring in-person learning to online space. And again, it gets that synchronous, asynchronous piece of what, what do we want, what should be in a synchronous lesson and what do we want students to be, to be doing on their own. Uh, we've also worked with Bright, um, that program that we've spoken of before, and a focus on well-being and anti-racism will continue. That was part of it and will continue uh, to be a part of it. I thought, depending on time, um, there was a really nice visual that's describing, uh, and let's see if I can share my screen. 
um, that describes some of the GOA work that we're doing. And it's I like it because it's simple. Um, and let's see if I can zoom in enough uh, where people can make sense of it. It's not letting me. There we go. So if we think about the, the work they're leading us on, you know, there's four areas of design for student agency. Um, so again, how do we get students organized and how do we get them engaged and, and um, connected to their learning? The wayfinding is a huge piece. That's something that we want to make sure that it's clear that students know when they're supposed to be online. Um, they know how to find the resources they need. You know, we do this in person, uh, right? If you walk into school and if you walk into a classroom, students know where to get a pencil. They know where their books are. In the online world, that's a really different environment and takes really thoughtful, deliberate planning. Uh, again, design for relationships, I spoke about that, and design for assessment, right? So traditional tests aren't necessarily the best tool. Uh, we could argue whether they're the best tool in general, but they're particularly not the best tool to understand student learning in an online interface. So we are actively working with um, them, and they've been incredibly helpful. The feedback that I've received has been very supportive. And at the elementary level, there's um, kind of message boards uh, that teachers have been posting on about all the resources they're learning. And what I love about it is it really is allowed for our staff members uh, to learn from one another as well as from the content. And, you know, just reading through what they're sharing, it's, do you see that? How about this? And and the resources are, are, are being kind of shared collaboratively, uh, which has been a really important thing. And one of the quotes I saw uh, and when someone told me was how many times, people, I wish I knew this in, in April. Um, I wish I'd had access to these resources in the spring, and obviously that wasn't so much in the cards in terms of the emergency, but I do feel like our staff are getting high quality professional development that'll set up a much more successful experience this fall than what we had this spring. Additionally, um, and I'll pause in a second for questions, uh, we have one at the high school, one in the Amherst, one, at, one in each of our three districts. We um, have three of our staff members who uh, have taken on roles as, or part-time roles as distance learning coaches this year. Um, they have set up a website that is um, evolving on a daily basis um, that has resources for students, resources for families and caregivers, and resources for staff members. Uh, they're providing trainings for staff. There was an optional training on a, different, a number of different platforms this week that had over 100 staff members uh, attend that. Uh, and teachers could have been doing that, or teachers and parents, they could have been doing other things, but uh, they saw value in it. And they're also, as I said, setting up uh, sessions for families, uh, which would be really uh, valuable and something that I think, again, when we look back last spring, we felt like we didn't do enough of. We did a lot over the summer for summer school. We had a lot better success with that. Um, and I think the last thing I want to mention on the PD and distance learning piece before I transition to ventilation and technology in other ways is that we've purchased with our um, COVID funds a number of digital learning tools. Um, so, you know, Dreambox Math, Kate, Keto Math, Everyday Math Online Resource, where we had that. Uh, Raz Kids, Newslia, Lexia, which is also Literacy and Mystery Science, which again, we had last year. So we're providing, we have a lot of high quality products for the asynchronous piece um, that students can be more self-directed on. Um, and so we think that that's really gonna focus much of our uh, elementary teachers' time and energy to provide um, active choice and instruction. Uh, that we know our students need from a relationship perspective and developmentally. And for some of that asynchronous time, we have a lot more tools at our disposal than we had last spring. And we think it's really critical. And there's going to be, you know, training for staff. There's a slide deck that one of our distance learning coaches put together, which just clearly explains these tools. And we'll be doing some more parent workshops over time on them as well. But what we know is that, you know, we don't want students on screens for six hours a day. Right? There's lots of evidence that that's not what we want. Uh, we also want to provide tools for families who might benefit from having uh, programs where they can make a choice for more math practice or literacy or science that are highly engaging and, and much more self-directive because we know how challenging it is for families uh, to be doing what they need to do as well as supporting their children in distance learning. That was a mouthful, so I'll pause there, um, or an earful, I guess. Um, I, I have a number of other things to share about fall 2020, but that was really focused on the distance learning uh, and professional development part. So if there's any questions now, I'll take them. And then after that, I'll, I'll keep rolling. Mr. Menino. Dr. Morris, how can a school committee member find out what distance learning is like? Uh, can you give us a, a sample class? Uh, uh, you can send out virtual schedules to the parents. Uh, could you send the school committee members a sample virtual schedule? I, I can't 
when I walk up and down the street, this is my only time out of the house. Uh, uh, neighbors say, what's going on? Uh, well, what can I tell? There's going to be distance learning. That's all I can tell them what's going on. Yeah, so early next week, we'll have that. You know, what we presented in the past um, was, was samples. We're getting much more refined. And now that we have staff feedback, uh, we're going to be finalizing those. So next week, I can definitely get you that. Um, I did send a video um, of some of the professional development in the slide deck to school committee. Um, in that in that slide deck, there are some clickable links where you can see examples of high quality distance learning. Um, so that that may be another place to take a look at uh, in terms of having that resource and, and being able to understand a little what it looks like. And then a point of clarification: you've mentioned it before, but there will be no opportunity for teachers and parents to get together physically at the beginning of the year. Is that correct? That's something that would have to be dealt with in negotiations with our association. Mr. Demling. So my question is about what our thoughts are as we as this ramps up and 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 kids kids um kids use it and and, and the weeks go by as the as the as the uh, school year goes on. What's our plan for for tracking engagement? And and it's a, it's a different question than than assessment. I don't mean like academic progress assessment. I mean like engagement. And I'm I'm thinking about this from the point of view of the you know, school committee spent a lot of time in our priority document, right, about looking at the spring emergency remote learning and, and, look, and thinking about the fall and really wanting to prioritize this higher level of student engagement. And so I think, I think everybody's on the same page and I, I think there's pretty clear understanding between, between us all about that. But then the question becomes, okay, you know, a month from now, six weeks from now, two months, how do we know that we've done that, right? And so how do we track that, that we've done that from like a systems level? And so I start to think about general metrics like uh, like uh, attendance, um, but but then you get get into the weeds because you can track attendance in different ways, and there may be other types of metrics. And and I I don't know all the details of the systems, so I'm just wondering, of you know, there might, the administrators of these systems must you know, must be wrestling with these kinds of questions. So that's one. The other, the other thing about tracking engagement is that you know there's obviously additional challenges with remote learning about um, tracking individual level of engagement because you know you don't want to lose with so many students in a large school district you don't want to lose track of individuals right when you when you when you see kids coming through the doors every day you have so many eyes so many adult eyes so many educator eyes on a student over the course of a day uh, and it's it's harder um, with with remote learning um, when there's that that um, there's that physical connection constantly um, and so how do we make sure that you know, kids aren't, you know, falling through the cracks, so to speak. You know, how do we make sure that not just the kids are doing their assignments and whatnot, but aren't, that, that they're engaging? So the sort of those two questions of student engagement, uh, yeah. aside from student progress. Um, yeah. And, and so, what, what your thoughts are on, on how, we, how we're doing that? Yeah. So, I mean, I think as opposed to last spring, one thing that's clear is that attendance is a requirement that teachers take every class every day. So that's not the full answer, but I want to answer it clearly on the attendance front. Um, I think in the larger piece, actually, this is something that um, you all met Obed over the summer, and we are really fortunate that he's doing an independent study with us this fall. Uh, so, you know, great experience for him, but I think we are were, we were the more better, the beneficiaries of that. And right now he's actually working on um, a kind of wellness and engagement tool that we would use routinely to get a sense of what's the lay of the land and what are students responding and how are they feeling? And, and so, you know, there's a relationship between wellness and engagement. Uh, in my opinion, I think there's a lot of evidence around that so that it's not at the only at the individual level, but it's at the, the group level that we're understanding how students are experiencing distance learning and how they're also experiencing the non-academic parts of, of distance learning, of not being in school. Uh, we've also talked about doing that in a mixed methods approach where he's able to do focus groups from time to time. So we hear from you know, at least middle school and high school students, a little harder, but maybe upper elementary grade students um, on how they're experiencing things. And again, at the younger grades, it may be more through the eyes of a, a parent or caregiver uh, or guardian that we gather that feedback. But we were, we really want to gather that feedback routinely because things are going to be different. I mean, I'm, I'll be honest, I'm concerned a little bit of how things will shift when we go from, you know, beautiful days like we're going to have tomorrow um, to when the days get shorter and, and it's colder um, and students are outside less often and just, you know, if you're like me, you tend to get a little nervous in November because it's, you know, it's going to be winter. Um, and for some people, that's great. And for other people, quite a few, that's less great. So we want to have that get a baseline and then be able to track that over time. 
um, to assess both the well-being piece, but also the engagement piece. And we want to do it in a, you know, he's looking up um, kind of scientifically based tools that will adapt for our purposes. But we want to be very clear that it's, you know, not about individual student, but we want to have that assessment. On the individual student level, um, we do have our counseling team. Um, and, you know, one of the points of real agreement between the, uh, you know, Amherst Pelham Education Association and, and us is really this focus on family engagement. Um, so some of the time next week uh, in that PD time will be dedicated to, to uh, having staff members start engaging the families that are in their class. Um, and so we know that's critical to go from the get go. We actually um, have built in time uh, at the elementary level in particular, but there's time in, in other schedules for family engagement on a regular basis. So it's not having to happen after school, but we wanna promote as much parent and guardian contact as we can, because we know without being in physical proximity, it's more of a challenge. And we definitely learned last year that communication was 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 one of the things that people felt wasn't flowing smoothly. So, you know, between our family center, our counseling teams at the school level, but also an enhanced view of actually building in time on a daily basis for there to be family communication. We feel like those are things that we didn't do last spring that hopefully yield more positive results um, in the fall. Sorry, long-winded, but better than just saying four, four words, I hope. <laughs> Thank you, that was helpful. Any other uh, questions on the first, first portion of uh, Dr. Morris's uh, update? Okay. Um, here we go. So that was that was the bulk of it, but it's certainly not all of it. Um, so um, I think I'll stay with the technology theme or distance learning. So uh, thanks again to the PGOs for raising those funds. Last year we used most of the hotspots. This year we're we're, we're just about using all of them based on the requests that have come in from families. So that. That's a gift that has continued to give beyond the spring. So I just want to again plug the Amherst uh, Public School or uh, all the PGOs for contributing to that effort because it continues to be a need in our community. We we're getting a little anxious about when Chromebooks will come in. Uh, you know, ours are coming in before the state order, but you know, um, things aren't flowing as normally as quickly as we'd like. So we, you know, our estimate got pushed back a week for that and the iPads. So uh, we may have to kind of raid some of the Chromebooks in the schools and, you know, put the new ones in the schools when students come in. But, uh, you know, Jerry Champagne and the IS department is doing tremendous amounts of work, uh, has lists from families um, and staff members on technology needs, and we're working as, as best we can. I believe the student desks for younger students was coming in this week. I think it might have come in today, but I've, I've lost track of that. Uh, if you remember that most of our students uh, at the primary grade levels use tables, but we really need desks. And so uh, hopefully the plan was uh, by Friday to get them in school so we can start setting up. We have plenty of time, but we want to get them there as soon as possible. We got, as you'll notice at the end, a generous gift of face masks uh, from um, a local company. Over, It's a six-digit gift, so we want to, we'll talk about it when we get gifts, but that's another wonderful tool for folks who want to wear that, uh, our staff members or want to wear that plus a mask will have that uh, opportunity. So thank you. We also had a great idea at one of the in-person town halls about buying cloth masks for young kids that they can decorate um, and make them assets their own and probably their backup because they want them bringing them from home. But um, it just, it seemed like, or if one gets, you know, soiled during the day, and so those were ordered and those have come in. So that's also really good news. And thanks again for all the contributions and suggestions. Many of you were at that town hall. I thought it was fabulous. And thanks to Ms. Consolino for taking quick action on that. Uh, the uh, second to last thing on the virtual is um, we did a non-binding survey of grades uh, of phase two and three families. So basically we did the phase one um, survey. We got about 68% of families saying they were coming back. And that one was a binding survey because it starts soon. Uh, we did a nine binding one just for planning. Uh, so far we've got over a thousand responses. Um, so about two thirds of the families we emailed, uh, we have responses from. And to date 69% of those uh, families, students uh, would choose in person and 31% would be fully remote. Um, so it actually matches the phase one almost exactly. Um, kind of interesting. One would have, I wouldn't have predicted it would be that close, but it seems like no matter who we ask, it ends up being between two thirds and 70% of families suggest that they would want their children back in school. There was some variation by school. 
uh, for what it's worth, Fort River had the highest percentage, 81% choosing in person, and the lowest was the middle school at 66%. Uh, again, not wildly off the average of 69%, um, but Fort River and Pelham were the, the highest numbers, and um, the secondary level had number 66 at the middle school, 67 at the high school, so they were a bit lower than the elementary numbers. But again, you know, relative to the scale, you know, pretty similar, you know, Fort River and Pelham, for whatever reason, were higher than the other two elementary schools. Um, but, you know, I thought that would be useful information for the committee to have. Um, and, and we are running into an issue, and it, and it may be something that we want to pull up, you know, at a Pelham meeting more specifically sometime soon. Um, if you might remember in our phasing plan, Pelham second grade uh, was in phase one, whereas in Amherst, uh, the second grade was in phase two. Uh, we did that because we have a lot of related service staff that work in multiple grade levels at Pelham. Uh, but what we're finding is with the split of remote and in-person and the collaboration across Union 26, uh, we're not sure we can actually pull that off very well if Pelham second grade is on a different timeline than Amherst second grade. Um, because again, there are some shared staff in terms of the virtual education. So it is something that you know perhaps next week we can have. I don't want to go into depth with all the committees here, but it may be that uh, even if we're meeting before a, a joint meeting, uh, it's probably worthy having a Pelham-specific meeting on second grade because there's some unanticipated consequences uh, that have come up with that decision that we probably should talk through uh, that's specific to Pelham. But I want to just tag it here um, so that we remember it at the end when we're doing upcoming topics. Can, I have a, can you, could we pause? I saw- uh, yeah, I'm gonna pause because I have one more about ventilation and testing results and, and then I that, that'll be the end. But I think this one, it was a good place to pause. Yeah, uh, I saw Mr. Menino's hand. That's why a, a while ago. So Mr. Menino? A minor point. Does decorating a cloth mask affect its efficacy? No. That's my question. <laughs> and, um, I I, I, I don't know how you how you decorate it, but we're not using scissors or anything to decorate it. It would all be <laughs> markers and things that go on. It's not like we cut out a snowflake or anything like that, you know. <laughs> I, I had a, a question of clarification on the, your comment about the Chromebooks coming in. Um, these are the additional Chromebooks that are required for one-to-one -one for the younger elementary. Is that correct? Yeah, so I mean, it, well, it really cuts the most of the secondary kids, with the exception of the seventh graders and new students, would have their Chromebooks from last year. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it really is looking at the elementary plus seventh grade in terms of the need for n Chromebooks. Mm -hmm. um, so again, we feel comfortable right now with, you know, rating's the wrong word, but utilizing the Chromebook carts that are in the elementary schools. Um, we were hoping not to do that because then it involves another transition when the carts come in, when the Chromebooks come in. But I think, uh, you know, at this point we may not get there. So we may have to use the ones from the school site and have the new ones that come in be for the in-person, you know, in phase one when we get there. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it, it's, you know, it, it's frustrating for everyone. The state just got pushed back to and they were hoping for early, late September. And now I hear they're at mid-October. Um, so this is. There's actually a bunch of, if you Google, you know, Chromebook delivery issues um, in schools, you'll find a lot of articles. This is a national issue. And there are some districts in other parts of the, the country that are saying not till Thanksgiving. So uh, we feel fortunate that Jerry was able to find resources that will be earlier than that. It's just when they actually will come in and same with the iPads. Um, sometimes they promise a date and it doesn't always come through. So a, um, a related question then, is there um, sort of a, a backup plan for, because we don't have iPads obviously in the, in, the, um, in the classrooms and because those grades now are starting for two weeks remote, what is our backup plan? It's really to use the carts that we have, you yeah. know, um, which isn't the best. And not every family has requested, and I, you know, uh, just to be really clear, not every family at the elementary level has requested a Chromebook. Some feel like they have whatever they have at home is sufficient. So um, that has really helped us with the numbers. We're a little, we probably wouldn't get there if it was literally every child who needed one, every student who needed one. Got it, thank, thank you. Ms. Spitzer. So just a really small thing is that I remember we were all issued iPads by the district and I haven't been using mine. I don't know if it's of any use, but I'm happy to bring mine back um, if, if it could be of use to, to the district. 
Thank you. I will raise that point with Mr. Champagne. Um, and we're not doing budget presentations for a while, um, which is the primary use for those from school committee members. So thank you. I had not thought of that, um, but it, it really could make a difference. So thank you. Yeah, likewise. I, I'm sure any of us uh, would be willing to. <laughs> Hand is over. Mr. Menino. Likewise, you can have my computer back. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Any other uh, comments or questions on the technology portion of the update? All right, so the last one is we had ventilation testing uh, completed over the last two weeks. We've talked about it at this meeting before. Uh, really what it was looking for, and it's a critical number, is air changes per minute, uh, or air changes per hour, excuse me. Um, <laughs> Mr. Harrington, I just scared. Um, but, um, and we were looking at the rooms that would be used in phase one, and we did a little more than that. And so we tested, we had tested over 80 different spaces. Um, I think it's worth noting that um, we did not taste any of this, test any of the spaces in the middle school because at phase one, um, it's it's a really small group of students who would be coming to the middle school. And so we'd be looking to relocate some of those, stu those, those students to be the high school. Um, that actually idea came from some of our um, special educators who work in specialized programs. There is one supervisor uh, of specialized programs at the middle school and high school. And just because it's so few students opening the school with you know, 25 students uh, just didn't make a lot of sense for the students themselves, nor for the, the staffing and custodial and nursing and, and all that. So uh, so you won't find real testing results at this time for the middle school. The idea is to test phase two um, spaces, you know, in the month of September so we get a good read on that. But overall, it was, there were really good results. Um, over 90% of our spaces tested over four air changes per hour. That's the increased ASHRAE standard minimum for um, for COVID times. If you look at other places, uh, other districts, you know, frankly, you know, like um, there's one district in, in Western Mass, but it's a, it's a comparative district that, you know, they were they were looking for numbers over two. I've heard that from my colleagues in, in, in more incredibly locally. So we, we have a higher standard of looking for four and, you know, over 90% of our spaces ended up there. Uh, so at Crocker Farm, we tested 14 spaces. They all tested uh, above four. The average was actually 7.3. Uh, one thing to note I should have said at the beginning is they were really enhanced by the air purifiers um, that we bought, the HEPA purifiers, because they, uh, depending on the size of the space, can increase it between one and two air changes an hour on their own. And that air is actually considered fresher than the air that would come from an open window. Um, at Fort River, we had 14 spaces tested. All of them were over four. The average is 5.5. .5. At Wildwood, we had 11 te spaces tested. The average is 7.7. .7. There was one space that was under four. It was at 3.5 or something like that, I think. And that was the library, which was tested in error. Not that the results were in error, but it, we don't need that for phase one. Um, we wouldn't have students in that space, actually, in general, but certainly not at phase one. Uh, but nonetheless, we have that result, and we're going to look at what we can do to enhance the air changes in that space. Uh, at Pelham, there were six spaces tested, and uh, they all were above four. The average is actually 13.3 in Pelham, which is incredibly high. Um, at high school, we had 41 spaces tested. Uh, there were five spaces that, that uh, fell under. Um, two or three of those spaces, uh, let me look, actually, I apologize. Um, three of those spaces, the units weren't functioning well. Um, they weren't functioning, so we're looking at those. Uh, and then in two of the spaces, the numbers were low. Uh, and so we're looking at all five of those spaces. We feel confident that at least three or four of them, we can get working above four and we'll have those retested in the next two weeks. The reality is with, uh, we, we, as you know, we're planning for phase one being 100% of students in person because we had, to we had to plan for the highest possible number with 68% of students planning to be back in person, we have enough spaces at our high school to meet the demand of all the students that we you know, would actually be coming back. So we're still gonna work on it because we know there's a phase two and phase three coming. So it's not like, oh, we're just not gonna worry about it. We're, we're gonna worry about it and work on them. Uh, but we, we know we now have sufficient spaces that are have the ventilation uh, above four for all students in phase one. So it was reassuring to know our buildings aren't super new. We're very, you know, an odd way fortunate. The more people I speak to, there's plenty of schools in Massachusetts that have no ventilation except open air and heat. 
right? They don't have actual univents that are, are functioning and, and thanks to the facilities team for purchasing. I uh, can't tell you how many calls or texts I've gotten from other superintendents in Massachusetts in the last two weeks saying, I heard he bought some things that are helpful. What are they? The unit number, you know, um, and I feel like I'm like a salesperson for that company now, but it's just because, you know, people were on the ball on our team at knowing that this was going to be something that was important on the HEPA, but also in, important on the ventilation side as well. Um, so I appreciate all the work that went into that. We certainly have more things to do and more things to test, but this, you know, this seems to be the metric that uh, across the country seems the most prevalent. If like you look at like, you know, the Chan Center at Harvard and what they're focusing on, the air changes per hour seems to be the metric that um, is, is particularly critical in terms of this, the era that we're living in right now. And so uh, we were really pleased to see the results. And, and I think the other thing to note, um, and I don't wanna, you know, I think it's worth saying these things don't happen by their own. We don't have the newest HVAC equipment. It happens because our facilities team has done routine, regular maintenance over the years that has kept these machines running effectively. And that's sort of noted actually in the the, the cover page that we received from the, the HVAC consultants. But I think it is really true. And when I talked to other places and, and I'm not gonna try to be negative and mention other districts, but there are districts really who are finding half their machines not working right now, um, whose report are not reports are not coming out with uh, almost any spaces above four, and their equipment's not wildly different than our equipment. So I really want to thank the custodians and maintenance staff for the work they do. Um, they don't have the Rolls Royce model of HVAC systems uh, in their schools, but their routine maintenance and their efforts has resulted in in the data that we got. It's not just kind of like oh, we have a great new building and that's why we have our data. It's actually because of the work uh, and the sweat that our staff puts into the buildings that that help get the results. And I, I just think it's a really important point because, you know, again, these results, and I'm not trying to say they're perfect and there's not things to work on, there certainly are, um, but they're really strong compared to other districts that we've talked to, particularly other districts with the era of building, vintage uh, buildings that we have. Um, and, and just I really want to thank our HVAC technician and our facilities team and our custodians for the work they do because, you know, it's not it's not the work that gets recognized enough, uh, but you're you're in a pandemic and you're in a crisis and you realize I'm really glad that they were keeping on top of that work. Um, so I'll stop there. But I just, you know, felt really strongly about acknowledging that the work didn't happen overnight or just this summer. It happened over years where other places, you know, have really different results that were buildings built at the exact same time. I, yes, um, um, I'll speak again. I'll, I'll let others speak first. Mr. Demling. Yeah. So uh, thank you for that update. That's, that's really great news. It's, um, you know, it's something uh, that we we've, we've known we've, we've wanted to get the results of for a little while. So it's, it's, it's great. Um, is, um, I guess just first, just logistically, if if we could get that made available on the website or the fall reopening website, I think there'll be a lot of public interest in the um, in the information. Uh, if if it, uh, w whether or not the uh, the the actual consultant report or, or summary, um, I don't I haven't seen the actual reports. So I don't know if it's if it's human readable or not. Sometimes those are, uh, but sometimes people like the source information. So. Um, uh, but in, in, you know, in, in a way that because I think people have been you know keyed into the idea of um, of the, the indoor air quality being a key piece to this, and uh, we've done a lot of we've had a lot of uh, lengthy discussions about that on school committee and focused rightly about all the variables that go into that. Uh, and this is this is one of those key pieces. And so um, the fact that, that that like you said, years of effort have gone into making this piece go very rightly, um, I think is going to be an important piece for the public. To understand, um, uh, I, I guess my question is, you know, so this this seems like a really big piece that that is has fell into place. So, like, so can we assume now that that like, I mean, do you feel like all systems are go for for return in person on for phase one students on October first? Is is this really like the one of the big final pieces you were you were waiting to hear on? Yeah, this is definitely a huge one. You know, and this is the one if you again, if you, I'm sure many of you are tracking this around the state. And this is one, you know, particularly the air changes and the ventilation seems like one where lots of people are struggling. And that's just a sad, sad state of school buildings in Massachusetts. That's not trying to put down any other districts who are struggling. I want to be really clear about that. But 
um, it's really hard. I mean, there's depression era schools, right, that have never have been updated with their HVAC system. They're not going to be at four, right? It doesn't matter how many air purifiers you put in the room. It's just not going to get there. Um, and so, you know, we still want to look at humidity and other, there are other aspects we want to look at, but a lot of those other aspects we're able to do ourselves. And we, you know, um, we're able to, to look at the humidity in our rooms on a routine basis. Starting in October 1st actually really helps, you know, hopefully by then we're done with the, the 95 degree days with 90% humidity that make things really hard in terms of ventilation um, and um, comfort level and humidity. So there are other pieces we want to look at, but, you know, if you look at all the research from like the parabola experience, I think I've shared some of that, um, you know, all that work, it, really the ventilation piece and how many air changes is, is a critical, critical piece. And that's why we emphasize getting that data early on. It's also not one that we can necessarily test ourselves very easily. Uh, I'll put it that way. Um, it, it, for those of you who've seen the data table, it's complicated, you know, about how you how you quantify this. Uh, we would put it on the website altogether because I think it's, it is a public document. There'd be no need not to. Uh, and we're not, we're also clear that there's a couple of rooms we need to work on, right? It's not perfect. Um, but, uh, you know, in terms of getting the sufficient spaces that have the specific, um, sufficient um, airflow uh, and ventilation, it was really, it was really great news. Mr. Menino. Following up on Mr. Demling's question, when do you think we'll have an agreement uh, whether or not school will be in person on October 1? So by agreement, I assume you're talking about bargaining uh, with yeah, our employees. When will, when will we know that uh, in-person learning on October 1st is assured? When will we know that? Yep. So I think the negotiations are ongoing. We had a session today. We have two more this week. And we're, I think everyone's working as quickly as they can to get to the place that you're talking about. But I can't claim to um, be able to answer your question um, explicitly. Um, it's the right question to ask. That's not a critique, Mr. Menino, um, because it's not something that um, I tend to like to predict things that I can control. Um, and this is this is has to be a joint agreement, right? And so everyone's working hard, everyone's trying their best. Um, but I think next week we'll meet and we'll have an update. And I'm, I, to your point, it feels like you know it's four weeks away, and that's feeling really soon to many people. And I want to acknowledge that point that I get that asked that question an awful lot too. Uh, the only often. reason I ask is that the eight people I meet on the road dog walking ask me that one question: When will we know? We will Thank communicate you. when we do know that uh, answer to that question loudly and widely. I, I think, um, and this is not to, to say that anybody anybody on this meeting has the answer to Mr. Menino's question, um, but just to clarify for folks at home, not everybody that is in this meeting on this call right now, um, it was part of the executive session that happened earlier where we specifically talked about um, this. Uh, so I just want to clarify so that folks aren't wondering why one of us is asking a question that we certainly should have knowledge about um, because we don't all have the same knowledge. Um, the, did anybody else have questions or comments about the ventilation? So, um, well, I'll, I'll add on to, um, or, or pile on if I will, um, that, that, this is really, really good news. I did, I did read the report um, when um, when it, you distributed it to the committee, and um, it, and and I will sort of join in the in the praise and and just deep deep thanks um, to our facilities and maintenance and custodial team that has been working on this um, a lot this summer as well as um, uh, over the years because. Um, in my mind, this was sort of the one question mark that we still had. We've put together um, our, our committees and, and the district has put together um, a really solid plan for, for safety and health and, and keeping our students, staff and families safe um, and back to school in person. And this was the piece that, as you pointed out, Dr. Morris, we couldn't test ourselves. And so we didn't know until we received this report. And I think that this is this is really huge piece um, and important good news um, for us to be able to feel confident um, in, in our plan. Um, and then 
I don't know if this is a question or a comment, but the HEPA filters and our ventilators are not the only items that are helping ensure indoor, um, you know, strong indoor air quality, correct? There's other other tools. This is, again, just one piece of many that together all of these pieces contribute to making um, being in stores, in, in schools, classrooms, um, uh, imaginable for during a pandemic. Is, is that correct? There's yeah, other- absolutely. So, you know, the filters within the Univents are all being replaced, the exhaust fans being replaced. Um, I'll say, you know, it's amazing being at Fort River and Wildwood, you know, probably Mr. Harrington and his other hat and I are the only ones who have uh, had the opportunity. But for those of you who have been in those two buildings to see what a half quad looks like um, is just wildly different. And, and I think in particular to your question, having the vents split so that it's not a shared vent system out uh, between the multiple quads, um, as well as having two unit vents in the space that are blowing and, and cross ventilating the air. You know, I, you know, there's no way to know what the results would have been in the old quad system, except uh, I'm not an expert, but I'm pretty sure they wouldn't have been as good uh, with the amount of temporary walls um, that were up that, that, you know, air travels over, but uh, they get in the way and the shared vent system. I just, you know, I don't believe it's true. I think our challenge is going to be what do we do post pandemic, but I'm, I'm, I'm worried about the pandemic problems now and, and less about the, the post ones because the, the classrooms are also beautiful. Like it, it's a strange thing to say. It doesn't solve all the problems in the buildings. They still need to be replaced. But compared to what I've experienced, both as a teacher at Fort River and and just walking around the schools, um, particularly Fort River um, with with the real wall um, and 1,900 square feet, they're huge spaces that have light coming um, in ways that it never did, and it really opened up the space in ways that I could never sort of imagine. They've still got lots of problems, but they've you know from a ventilation airflow. Uh, it really feels like a different space, um, you know. And Mr. Herring, I'm not going to put you on the spot and asking your other role, but you know, it's it, it's 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 not something that you don't realize when you right when you walk in that you you know you hear you know you get the blowers going from both ways. You can open up windows that uh, even though one's in a courtyard, the other one's outside, and you can get cross ventilation that way. Uh, and just knowing that the venting, it's really clear that there's an end to that, and that it's it's only one classroom at a time sharing that. Um, it really does make a huge difference. So all those efforts that our facilities custodial and maintenance department have made, I think you're right, contribute to, um, uh, you know, a, a better experience, you know, uh, and we're learning a lot for our post COVID times too. You know, again, that's not where our focus is, but I think we're learning a lot about uh, what we can do and how we can do things better um, and how we can support our, our fantastic staff better um, in terms of custodial maintenance so that, you know, we have long-term benefits of this work as well. Anybody else have a, have questions or comments, Mr. Harrington? I was kind of going to hold off my, on my comment until I was talking to the facility staff directly tomorrow. But yeah, I, I absolutely do have to commend like the the folks who have dedicated like countless hours to this and in their professionalism. We have an awesome staff in general, and I I, I kind of want to I don't want to embarrass anyone, but our our HVAC specialist is, I mean, he's hands down probably one of the most professional people I've ever worked with. And I mean, his, his dedication kind of drove this and I, I just want to commend him. Can I say his name? Is, is, is it all right to say his name? So Please do. Doug Pion. He is a, Doug Pion is an absolute champion. So I just wanted to say that. Yeah. We had a, we had a consultant a couple of years ago, came in for a project and said, you know, you know, your HVAC guy is a magician, right? I was like, yes, I do. <laughs> I do. I do. I'm aware of that. Um, but, but I'm glad you mentioned that and I'm glad Doug's getting called out publicly because he's really done a great job. Thank you for that. Any, any other comments? Um, seeing none. And, and Dr. Morris, I believe you confirmed that this, the report you'll be posting it on the fall 2020 webpage. Yeah, we'll put that up tomorrow. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, we'll put the full report, the summary, the two summaries, but also the, the, the room by room data. Excellent. Good. If there are uh, no more comments or questions on this, we move on. Great. Okay. Uh, so next is our future agenda planning. Um, and I think we are looking at having a meeting next week. Um, 
uh, in a, a joint meeting of the three committees again? Um, well, I think there's it's going to be another one that's complicated because I think the region's going to have to meet to talk and vote on athletics. Uh, Pelham, I think we'll have to, we, we, maybe we'd do it in separate meetings, but Pelham's going to have to meet and talk about grade, or I would like to encourage us to talk about grade two and what phase they're in. And I think that should be a Pelham specific meeting. And then we probably should have an update to Mr. Menino's question to update the community on where we are, if there are, if there are updates to be had, where we are, and, and it, if nothing else, to more on distance learning and some of the questions about schedule. So, um, 926, I don't know if my head's in the right place to think about if we can do all those things. And we may need an executive session as well. Um, so I don't know if we can do all of that in one night or if it makes sense to break it up and do uh, at least one, if not more of those topics, um, not all together. And there may be other things, but those are the ones in my head that we, we would have to do. Um, did we have an update on the, uh, have we heard on the Title IX policy? That was another one that I think we would mention in past meetings. Yeah, I've talked to, I'll see, I'll um, talk to, um, I think the attorney was just about done with the draft of a, a, a sample policy for us to review. So I'll put that on my list tomorrow um, to see if we can get that document um, out to everybody here. Great. Any other um, agenda topics, Mr. Sullivan? Yeah, since we got an update on athletics tonight and not everybody participates in athletics, I'd like to hear an update on performing arts and possibly clubs. Mr. Denling? Uh, now that we're into September, I know we're going to have overlapping processes, but we do have to, at some point, start talking about 2020-2021 superintendent goals before the 2020-2021 year ends. <laughs> Actually, oh, I'm sorry. Ms. Seeger, I understand. Ms. Seeger? If, if you wanted to respond to him first, that's, that's fine. No. Um, what I'm interested in learning more about as, as a representative from Leverett is at some future meeting, what, what's going on with discussions for the sixth graders in Amherst slash Pelham moving to the middle school. And I realize that might be totally on hold, but at some point I'd love to catch up on it so I can share it with uh, my community. Thanks. What I'd like to um, also at our next um Region, it, it probably isn't a joint topic, but also just map out um, our calendar for the year so that we can get back to at least pr more predictability or, it, or try to. I don't think it will ever be predictable during this year. But Ms. McDonald, um, I don't know if there's any evaluation stuff and when that date is, um, or Ms. Spitzer, I don't, I don't know. Um, if that's next week or the week after. So I couldn't remember. I believe it's the week after because committee members have until the 14th to complete the evaluation. Um, so it would be the 21st, uh, 22nd. The 14th is the Monday, correct? Yeah. I think so. So yeah. the week of the 21st would be when we would review the results. Right. Thank you. Okay. Um, they're moving on to the next item. We have the warrant report. Um, I know Ms. Spitzer has several. I have one, so I'll let you look, dig up yours and get ready while I read my one. Um, so. Uh, I, Allison McDonald, authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $270,499.23 for a warrant dated August 19th, 2020. This includes general fund expenses of 
$39,810.90, revolving fund expenses of $230,688.33. Um, and I signed that on the, it looks like the 19th. So Ms. Spitzer. So quick question. I have some um, annual scholarship payments. I'm assuming I shouldn't be reading out loud the names of the students or should I be? It, there was no summary provided for me. It's just, I have the, the warrant, so. I'm I think you can read them, but probably playing it safe is always a good idea. Okay. So I'll just, more information is available upon your request if you would like to know more about the warrant scholarships. <laughs> but um, I've got 10 of these, so. Um, I'm going to try to be as quick as possible, but hold with me. All right. So um, I carry Spitzer authorized by my signature um, payments for annual scholarships in the amount of $3,000 on um, for a warrant dated August 13th, 2020. Um, I also authorized by my signature a request for funds for student activities funds in the principal's checking amount. Um, there was a transfer request from the senior high school in the amount of $17,639.06, um, which was dated July 31st, 2020. I, Carrie Spitzer, authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $117,674.50 for a warrant dated August 6th, 2020 for general fund expenses of that amount. Um, this was signed by me on August 16th, 2020. That one looks like a repeat. I also authorized by my signature a payment for um, annual scholarships on August 20th, 2020 in the amount of $500. Um, I authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $731,289.55 for a warrant dated August 20th, 2020. That was for general fund expenses of the same amount and was signed by me on August 25th, 2020. Um, Um, I authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $156,944.40 for the warrant dated August 18th, 2020. Um, this covered general fund expenses of $125,363.23, revolving fund expenses of $4,900.82, and grant fund expenses of $26,680.35. And this was signed by me on August 25th. Um, I, Carrie Spitzer, authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $289,562.47 for a warrant dated August 28th, 2020. This covered um, general fund expenses of $164,482.96, revolving fund expenses of $27,000. 2746 dollars and 11 cents and grant fund expenses of 122,150 dollars and one cents and other funds um, in the amount of 183 dollars and 39 cents and that was signed by me on September 2nd of 2020. I also authorized um, annual scholarship payments in the amount um, on August 26 2020 in the amount of two thousand dollars. And I believe that is it. So thank you. Great. Uh, next we have, um, moving on to our next item, we have gifts. Um, and we do have some to play. I just pulled it up so I can display it, Dr. Morris, if you. Would you like me to display it? Sure. Yeah, I'm happy to do it. Um, is 
Is that visible? Yes. Would somebody uh, somebody feeling uh, interested in, in making a motion? I'm still unmuted, so I'm happy to. <laughs> Just <really. laughs> um, so I move that the, are these all to the region? Okay. I move that the um, Amherst Regional, I, I move that the Regional School Committee accept the following gifts from the Children's Theater Foundation of America, number 1174, to support the Amherst Regional High School Theater Program in the amount of $1,000. From Scott and Karen Garman, number 694, to support the Amherst Regional Pelham Public School, sorry, athletics donated, donated their cancellation refund. Thank you very much. It's in the amount of $456. From anonymous dash your cause number five six zero two zero six six eight zero eight to support the middle school at the principal's discretion in the amount of ten dollars. From anonymous your cause number five six zero two zero seven eight nine six six to the middle school at the principal's discretion in the amount of twenty dollars. From the ARPS PGO Inc DBA. ARMS PGO to support the ARMS teacher lounge improvements in the amount of $500. Um, from AM Lithography and Packaging Corporation, 55,800 face shields for Amherst Pelham Regional and Public Schools, estimated value of 100, more, $111,600. $111, Such a big number, I'm having trouble reading it. Thank you very much. For a total, and this total must be, oh, this is the total of the non-estimated um, amount is $1,986. Thanks for bearing with me. Oh, and in addition, um, in compliance with state regulations regarding the receipt of gifts, I suggest that the Amherst, Re Amherst Pelham Regional School Committee officially accept these donations at its next scheduled meeting. In addition, um, the Children's Foundation of America 2020 Robertson Award to John Bechtold um, in the amount of $5,000. And congratulations to him. That's fine. Oh. Um, I'll second that. Um, any discussion? Dr. Morris? Yeah, I just want to, for those of you who don't know, um, John Bechtold's a theater teacher at our uh, high school. and. He won a major national award. Um, he's, he's the recipient, as you saw, of the Reba R. Robertson Award. Um, and, you know, he does a tremendous amount of work. And this is a huge honor um, that uh, it's actually every other year, excuse me, um, since 2008. And it's just, it's, it's, um, it's well deserved. I think you all know. I think you've, many of you have seen Mr. Bechtold present at the regional school committee about his programming, you know, those who've been on the committee multiple times. And um, it, he is a treasure for our schools and for students. And I'm just so pleased that he's receiving the recognition for his amazing creativity and dedication to students. I mean, I always joke if, if I'm ever locked out of the high school at any hour, I, you know, I can either call the principal or I could call John Bechtold because he's probably there. Um, and I'm just so glad that his hard work, dedication, um, and uh, great work is being recognized. So just want to call call that out uh, for, so people know what it was, that it's it's a huge, huge award uh, in terms of the recognition and honor, and, and it's well-deserved by John. Could you um, describe a little bit more about the gift from AM Lithography, please? Oh, yes, absolutely. So this is um, a company that has shifted and they're doing face shields and they reached out to us and said, you know, we're happy to, you know, donate some face shields to a local school district. And we thought that, you know, maybe they'd give us, you know, 50 or 100. And they said, no, what do you want? And, you know, you always, you know, pinch yourself and say, really? You know, and they said, no, no, just tell us what you need. So we looked and uh, we assess what we might need over a whole year if, you know, all the scenarios of teachers wearing them and, and wanting to wear them with masks. And um, and they said, no, no problem. Um, we're happy to do that. And they're coming in this week. Um, and so they reached out. That was all through Ms. Contolino and, and kind of her knowledge of folks in the field. So it's, it's uh, incredible that there's that kind of donation. But I think that's we're fortunate to live in Western Mass where people 
uh, are, are really dedicated to kids being in school and making sure everyone's doing that safely. That's wonderful. Mr. Menino? Are these those plastic masks that look like welding things uh, that, that people wear on their head? Yes. Wow, that's something special. <laughs> There's no further discussion. Um, then we'll move on to a vote. Um, this did, is a vote called. Was there? Did sorry. You your motion get a second? I seconded it. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. But thank you. <laughs> um, and this is a, a region vote. So uh, we'll do a roll call vote. Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Kenny. Kenny, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Seeger. Seeger, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Ms. Dancer. Dancer, aye. Ms. Sullivan. Sullivan, aye. And McDonald, aye. Um, so the motion passes uh, nine to zero. And I believe. Uh, does somebody from Amherst want to make a motion? I move to adjourn. Lord, second. Moved by Spitzer, seconded by Lord. There's no discussion. Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer. And McDonald, aye. aye. The Amherst School Committee is adjourned. Somebody making a motion for the region? I'll move to adjourn. Lord, Lord second. Moved by Spitzer, second by Lord. There's no discussion. We'll move to a roll call vote. Mr. Demley? Demley, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Kenny. Kenny, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Seeger. Seeger, aye. Ms. Spitzer, Spitzer aye. Ms. Dancer. Dancer, Mr. aye. Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan, aye. And McDonald, aye. Uh, the region is adjourned. Bye, everybody. Okay, here we are. Um, all right, so our only um, item is the superintendent evaluation and the evaluation instrument. Um, so, oh, yes, go ahead, Ron. Is this Thanks, being Amherst broadcast? Media. They're willing to support our Pelham friends for a limited amount of time um, so that it continues to be broadcast. Uh, limited. <laughs> Is this a first Second, for our committee? Actually. Yeah, they've been very generous the last couple of weeks okay. where we've had some small Pelham only meetings. Thank you, Amherst Media. I did so, tell yes. them that when we're back in person that there's often food and we'd invite them. That's fair. No. Okay. Um, so Dr. Moore sent around his one pager um, with the links to the artifacts. And then I had also circulated the evaluation instrument. So I guess any we can talk about timing and also questions. Um, some of the things that have come up Anyone on the committee currently may complete an evaluation, regardless of how much time you've served on the committee, but it's not a requirement. Um, so with that instrument, typically, and so Mike, do you know, does Sasha, will she be able to do the survey monkey thing like she had done for the region? Yeah, I think once she gets a go ahead from you, she'd be all set. Okay, yes. So she puts together a survey monkey, so you can just go through and fill it out that way. Um, so I guess any questions on either the 
artifacts document or the, the actual evaluation instrument. Okay, yeah, Mr. Menino, or no, let's go, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> I found the one pager from Mike uh, informative and helpful. Uh, as usual, I find the questionnaire a little difficult to follow, but I figure it out as I go along. I want a chance to uh, evaluate him as quickly as possible. Okay, great. Any hesitation on voting on the instrument tonight or any other questions? Okay. Well, I will take a motion to vote on that instrument. I move that we accept the instrument as presented. Great. Second. Second. All right. Any further discussion? All right. Um, all right. I'll do a roll call vote. Ron. Ron, yay. <laughs> I didn't know what to <laughs> I know. I switched back to first names. I can't handle the Mr. and Ms. Okay. Uh, Margaret. Uh, answer I. Sarah Bess. Sarah Bess, I. Brenda. Brenda, I. And Hall, I. Okay. Um, and then in terms of timing, um, I know for the region, they're doing two weeks. I mean, to... Um, well, I guess, Dr. Morris, I'll ask you, do you feel like you, do you want the, when we're done, do you want the presentation to be part of a separate meeting so you're not getting into these marathon meetings and we can be a little more flexible? Do you have a, a preference? I don't. I mean, my my experience the last couple of years is it's a lot of work for the chairs. I don't want to minimize that, but actual the actual evaluation conversation, it tends to be quite brief. Um, like I think a lot of the work, my experience, is a lot of the work of the committee has been on the front end of like reading all the artifacts and doing the evaluation. And then when, when it's actually compiled and voted, it tends to be a rather brief meeting. So it doesn't either way is fine with me. Okay. All right. Um, and I guess for other committee members in terms of how much time you have and how much time you need to do this, do, do folks have opinions about when we would do it? Yes, yeah, our best. Um, can it just not be the same week so there can be a week in between? I am feeling slammed with school committee shifts. The, the same week as the as the region. Yeah. Okay. So t I I was not really paying attention. When when is that due? The fourteenth. Due on the fourteenth. Okay. Um, could we target something for the following week? Would that be okay. All right. Um, all right, so we'll do that. When Sasha puts it together, I'll have her send out a more clear actual deadline. Um, okay, I think that's it. Um, any questions on process or anything? Just when will we get it from Sasha? Um, well, I'll, I'll send her an email, I mean, I think she can put them together fairly quickly, but I don't want to promise a date. So okay. soon-ish, but she's got approximately 1 million other things. So, but I'll, I'll let you know when I hear from her when, when she thinks it'll be. All right. Anything else? All right. I'll take a motion to adjourn. I move we adjourn. Whoa, that's the fastest motion I've seen in a while. <laughs> Yes. Okay. <laughs> Brenda, did you just second? I did second, yes. Right. Okay. Um, all right. We'll call vote. All right. Sarah Bess. Sarah Bess. Aye. <laughs> Brenda. Brenda, aye. Ron. Ron, aye. Margaret. Margaret, aye. And Hall, aye. Pelham is adjourned. <laughs> Have a good night, everyone. Good night. Take care.